Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Today, an Italian-Australian and the number one selling bilingual comedian in the world, a producer, actor, and photographer. He has been called the Italian Seinfeld and was an internet millionaire by the age 27. His comedy is centered around Italian families and experiences. He's a wedding MC and a corporate entertainer. He's dubbed the biggest comedian you've never heard of. From Sydney, Australia, please welcome to the show, Joe Avati. Joe, welcome to the show. Hi, Tommy. How are you? I'm actually in Melbourne at the moment. Born in Sydney, but I live in Melbourne. Um, but uh, yeah, not many people know that. Your family and your parents are from Calabria, Italy, and they moved around a lot. You were yeah. considered a shy, somewhat quiet child. At nine years old, what happened when you watched the TV documentary on the Beatles? Yeah, well, I, um, I, I, I remember thinking, I want to be them. So I remember I, you know, I was fascinated by the transaction as to why there was four guys on stage singing and really you couldn't hear them because there was, the, the girls were screaming so much. <laughs> but I wanted to know what that transaction was between these four guys up here on stage and these thousands of women here, right? And I became obsessed with that, that transaction. And so it made me want to be that. I wanted to be those four bikes on, on, on stage. So I pursued that for a very, very long time. And I dreamt about it a lot when I was a kid. And I manifested it. Now, I didn't become a, a singing rock star, but I think um, I became a rock star of comedy around the world. And I'm happy with that. That'll do me, Tommy. That'll do me. Is it true then, Joe, did you teach yourself piano and guitar and write songs? That's right. So I started off with a tennis racket. Really? In front of the mirror. Uh, you know, so I started playing the tennis racket. Then I, um, my brother got a keyboard for his birthday, but he never played it, ever. I don't think he even laid a finger on it. I took it and I started teaching myself to play the, the keyboard and then the guitar. And it got to a point where I was writing classical music, um, classical piano music and, and pop songs without ever having a lesson. I still have never had a lesson. Uh, and that to me is more about the kind of person that I am, the kind of brain that you need for, to succeed because I never did comedy and within four years I was touring the world. I never studied food chemistry at school, but I, I ended up doing a double degree in food science. Um, and so, you know, I never built a house and my house was voted – coolest home in Australia last year, top 10 coolest homes. So it's a matter of what what's in here that will make you achieve anything. Listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put a link to Joe's Instagram page about his home, Joe at Home. Uh, if you want to see something, you got to see this, this renovation project he overdid. I mean, that house that you did is, is beautiful. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much. We sold it, actually. So it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's gone now. Well, I mean, it's, I'm still in it right now. But in about a month's time, I'll, I won't be here anymore. You talked about you studied food science, became a double yeah. major. When you yeah. got into the ice cream business and started developing flavors such as honey nougat for Magnum ice cream, were you thinking yeah. that was going to be the career path or was comedy still on your mind at that time? Yeah, no, you know what? I So I started comedy when I was at university. So... I thought, you know what, because I wanted to be a rock star, but A, I never had the voice, and B, as you know, Tommy, having an Italian background, you know, there's no rock stars from Calabria, man, <laughs> so in Sicily. So, so my dad said, listen, there's no rock stars where we come from. Go get a degree and do whatever you want. So I got two degrees, and then I thought, this is my way to, to becoming that rock star, was to do comedy. So I... Um, I, yeah, I, I always knew that, that doing food science was a means to an end because while I was, I was working um, as a food scientist during the day, about three or four nights a week I was doing tryouts. So, yeah, I was headed for something different. 
Last question on the food side, then we're going to get all into your comedy. Yeah. Explain to my listeners and, and me as well, what is Vegemite and what does it taste like? Okay. So Vegemite was born from – so when, you, when you're um, brewing beer, um, the yeast of the beer, you've got two types of yeast, yeast that floats – and they've got the yeast that sinks to the bottom. So if you imagine the tank like this, right, and they drain it out, they drain all the beer out once it's fermented, there's a, there's a whole bit of gunk at the bottom of that. So they, they weren't sure what to do with all that yeast. So, so it's, it's, a very, it's a very savory, umami-flavoured um, spread that you put on, on toast. Now – you know, it's an acquired taste. I love it. I love it with butter, but it, but that's what it is. It's extremely salty, um, and uh, some people love it. Some people don't. I, I I love to bring a jar with me to North America when I'm on tour, and I say to people, "You got to try this Australian Nutella." So I put it on the bread, and, and they of course they think it's all sweet. The look on their face when they when they taste it is priceless, and I'm, of course I'm laughing, and I, and I do it for myself. To make myself laugh. <laughs> and I lose a friend at the same time. Yeah, that's-, that's actually a really good prank right there. That's a really good prank. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Tuesday, July 11th, 1995 at Sydney's original comedy store. First time yeah. on stage for five minutes at an open mic night. What yeah. did that five minutes do for you in your career? Well, you know, it, it, it cemented the fact that I could do it because most people who get up um, to do open mic get no laughs, and they get no laughs for quite a long time. I got laughs on the opening night. Now, uh, and so that just that just gave me the confidence that I can do this. And I always say to young comedians, if you get up for five minutes and you make the crowd laugh for one of those five minutes but you die the rest of the four minutes, that's fine. You've got what it takes. You now just have to fill out another 90 of those one minutes and you've got a show. And, of course, that takes time. Um, I, when I got up on stage, I had already had practice at parties, at, at private parties, because I had this great memory for jokes. So my friend would say uh, – so someone would say a joke. I would then say one. Someone would say another one. I would say another two. Someone would say another one. I would say another three. Then by the by the fourth or fifth time I got up, people went, shit, this guy is the joke guy. He knows all and of course it wasn't stand up that I was doing. I was doing stand up, but I was doing stand up with old jokes. So by the time I got to the comedy store in Sydney, I already had the knack of being able to tell jokes. So I was confident. All I had to do now was come up with a whole bunch of original material. And that's what I ended up doing. So yeah. Listeners, go to the show notes as well. I'm gonna put a link to the YouTube channel for Joe. You watch two videos and you're going to be hooked. All of a sudden it'll be an hour later, two hours later, and you're going to still be sitting there hitting the next one, watching the next one. This this guy is extremely hilarious. I'm telling you, his stuff is really, even if you're not Italian, trust me, just listen and watch. It is, it's good stuff. You don't have to be Italian. You don't have to be Italian. A lot of people, you know, because I I did shows in Italian, it is so much in people's minds. Oh, this is the Italian Australian guy. I'm just an Australian comedian who, who's successful around the world with who started off doing ethnic humor and I still do ethnic comedy. Um, but, I, but, but it's, I do a whole lot of other things. It's got nothing to do with being ethnic. Yeah. Six months later, you were a professional after going on stage that first time. Yeah. Do you still do shows in English and then some in Italian or is everything in English now? Everything's in English now. I mean, look, sometimes I'll get, I'll get asked to do a show for a very Italian audience and I'll ask, you know, how many Italians, and if there's predominantly Italians, I will resort to my Italian material because that's what people want to hear. But I do it in such a way now that even if you're not Italian, I don't do chunks of it in Italian. I'll do a couple of gags in Italian, but I'll do them such that they can be translated or such that the body language is so um, clear what I'm saying. So even if you don't understand the, the nuance of the word, Ah, right, I get what he's doing because of the body language, yeah. But I I loved it. I mean, to be able to make people laugh in two languages, to be able to make people laugh in one language is hard enough. To be able to do it in two languages is is challenging, but it actually opens up 
so much more to the character because if I was to impersonate my grandfather, my grandfather would speak in English and Italian. Mm. So if I'm impersonating him in English, it's not entirely authentic. And if I'm doing them all in Italian, again, it's not entirely authentic. It's that broken English that he used to do. That's where the authenticity comes in. Listeners, if you haven't heard of Napster, go to Google, type it in. It was an old-time platform for media files and music and stuff. What did Napster do for your career? Well, Napster made, <laughs> um, Napster made me uh, famous around the world within six weeks. Uh, made me very rich. And um, uh, it was great. I mean, there, was, there, were, there were people like Metallica back in the day who were taking Napster to court because obviously people were downloading their audio files mm -hmm. and not buying their albums. Well, for me, it, it was the opposite. I didn't. I had an album, but what Napstar did for me was way more than what the album could have done had it gone out through the traditional ways. Napstar was right at the precipice of file sharing, and it was the most famous one at the time. So now, obviously, you know, you've got the YouTube, which is audio and visual. So this was just audio, and that was enough to launch me. So I, I would get... I had a, a, a fan page called Joe, join the Joe Avati party. And back in those days, maybe five people every two weeks would join. Well, one day I went away and I came back. I turned on my computer because I didn't have a laptop back then. And I had, over in three days, 10 join the Joe Avati party. And I thought, oh, some idiot has pressed the button <laughs> 10 times. Then I have a look and they're all different people, all from Canada and America, asking me when I'm coming. And from 10 a day, it would end up to being two, 300 a day after six, seven weeks from people. And I went, wow, what? So obviously something's going on here. And what had happened was that one of my clips went viral and I became what they call a household name or well, an overnight sensation in about six weeks. And, and I've been touring ever since, Tommy. That's what Napster did for me. Here's where I give you a lot of respect for. And listeners, this show isn't just adult only. Joe uses no profanity, no controversial material. So you can bring your entire family to your show. I tip my hat for you for that because I think it's fantastic that you're able to bring, eliminate that stuff and still have the success you have. Thank you, Tommy. And, and look, I've got seven comedy specials. I'm about to record my eighth comedy special. None of them have got any swearing on it. I might say shit, but rarely. There's definitely, I don't drop F-bombs. I don't really talk about sex or anything that's going to offend anybody. It's just, this is um, just sort of observational comedy. That's why they called me the Italian Seinfeld, because um, it was observational comedy without, you know, clean observational comedy about family, about everyday, uh, everyday things. Um, for example, we just had a, a baby boy. And we bought him a cot. But, Tommy, this cot comes with a 25-year warranty, <laughs> right? Now, I know the kid's Italian, but he has to leave home at some point. You know, just little <laughs> things like that. Uh, I do a lot of touring in country towns. And, um, you know, when you go to a, in a hotel room in a country town, they've got the bathroom, and they've got that um, the hairdryer. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't look like you or I need it, really. Right. But they've got the hairdryer. You know, sort of a hairdryer that comes out of the wall and it's got a, a, a long lead on it. Yep. So I was looking at it and on the lead had a little plastic sort of a tag and on the tag it had do not use in shower. And I thought, how dumb are people? How really? So what, you're going to grab the hairdryer and try and use it in the shower. Number one, you're going to get electrocuted. <laughs> Number two, how are you supposed to dry wet hair? And, and, and it's those little things that I notice when I travel around that I bring into my show and little and the same way that I notice the little bits and pieces about my family. Like my Italian grandmother, when I would go to her house, I'd get a big bit of bread and, and open up the butter container. When I opened up the butter container, there were olives. There was no butter. And, and it used to frustrate me. And every, every ethnic has gone through that. Every ethnic grandmother puts whatever, in the ice cream container was always tomato sauce. So yes. can you imagine on a hot summer day how frustrated we were? So they're the little things that I noticed and I put in my show and 
that's why I never I needed to go to profanity. And I've been doing this for 25 years. And as you said, so I get three generations of people. I would get the grandparents. I get their children and their grandchildren all sitting down in the same row watching the one act. And they all get different things from it. So the grandparents are going, yeah, yeah I do that. The, the kids are going, my parents do that. <laughs> And the, and the grandchildren are going, no, 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 do that. Um, or mum and dad do that. And it's a wonderful thing. And there's not many artists that can actually have that whole group of people coming. You bring families together so well. Do you get feedback after your show that people are talking about? What Joe is saying is, is right. That, that's exactly what happens to us. I, I hear it in the show when I do something. I can hear it. People going, "That's so true." That's. So, I think that's the thing that people say the most, or when they come up to me in the street, they go, "Mate, we want to thank you for what you're doing." Um, and it's just so true. It, it's funny how people like get blown away by the truth of it, and like it really hits home. And that's called in joke. That's an in joke. So when you can have a whole career of in jokes. Where, see, I've got my tribe, and my tribe are my people that have been coming to the show for, for years. You know, they're predominantly ethnic people, but they're predominantly people who've grown up in the 70s and 80s. I've become a bit of a poster child for people who've grown up in the 70s and 80s because I talk a lot about the things that we did in the 80s. Because kids today think they're cool because they download, <laughs> but you and I were the first downloaders. That's right. Because we used the cassette. Right, right, and we used to hurry up and press pause before the DJ started talking. Right, that's right. So that's the kind of stuff that I talk about when I talk, when I address the eighties stuff, and it's so true. What about? Do you remember this one? See, kids today they they get their their cell phone and they put it up and they use Shazam and Bang and they yeah. Do you remember how we used to like download our music? Is we used to hear the song on the radio, and if the DJ didn't tell us. We used to have to go into a record shop and sing the song. Do you remember, Tommy? Yeah. And the guy on the record counter knew the song, but he'd always make you sing the second verse. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and it's those kind of little things that I remember that I bring out on stage. So it does bring families together. It does bring people. And, yeah, they do say, that is so true. I should, that's what I should call the, the tour. That is so true. There you go. Your next tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What does it mean to you to become the only Australian artist to have two comedy albums in the top five anywhere in the world with the one in late 1999 living La Dolce and in late 2000 live and Unplugado? Yeah. Um, uh, that's, I'm very proud of that achievement. Um, not many people know that. Uh, it's not really. See, I, I, I was f kind of famous in Australia, but then I went overseas and became more famous there, and then I started to become more famous in Australia. So the, the, at, at the time when I had the two number one albums or the two albums charting simultaneously in the top five, I wasn't in Australia. I was in Canada and America because that's where they were charting. So the whole Australian market missed out on that. On that, so that that was a big news in Canada and America, but it wasn't big news in Australia. Um, I'd love for the Australians to know that, but you know, hey, I, I you know, the, the the Canadians and the Americans know it. We've got it documented. Um, you see me doing store signings with five hundred people. You see the album at number one at HMV. It was pretty cool, yeah. you know, to to be twenty seven, twenty eight years old and have a number one album around the world, comedy album. Um, Especially when in the top five, the other three people that were sharing that spot was Seinfeld, Dennis Leary, and Bill Cosby. Mm. So I had number one. I think Bill Cosby himself was number two. I was number three. Seinfeld was number four, and Dennis Leary was number five. So, you know, no one's ever going to take that away. No, that's pretty cool. Joe, how did you get your first break into the United States, and where was that show at? So the first, the United States, again, was launched by Napster. Okay. Uh, and I performed in New York. So I did New York, New Jersey, Boston, uh, uh, Chicago as well back then, Buffalo and upstate New York. Um, and, I, you know, I performed in, in different places and now it's kind of expanding. I'm coming back. I'm doing New Jersey, New York. I've done, I did Chicago just before COVID broke. Uh, and I'll be back there next year. Uh, Boston again, I did at some point. You know, I'm always coming back because I have a, a, a child in North America 
And so I'm constantly coming back. And uh, and while I'm there, you know, it just makes sense to, to work. So I, I the, the tours are broken up now. But I'm doing New Jersey now. I'm doing San Jose and Los Angeles for the first time ever, which is really, really exciting. That'll be in July this year. We got to get you to Las Vegas. We're going to work on that, Tommy, because I have had people ask me if I'm going to Las Vegas. And some people I know are traveling from Las Vegas to Los Angeles to see the show, but let's, why not? Let's do it. That's right. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's do it. I'd love to come see you live in person. Yeah. In 2002, you took three of your grandparents to Canada for two yeah. weeks on tour with you and then brought them on stage. What was yeah. that experience like for you? But more importantly, what was it like for them? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you that for me, um, it was probably the proudest moment I've ever had career wise. I'm very proud of my children, but I'm very proud of that. I don't think anything that I will ever do will top that, Tommy. Uh, you know, give me a Grammy Award, make me win an Oscar, you know, which I probably <laughs> would never do anyway. But <laughs> um, there's nothing, there's nothing that I've ever done that makes me prouder. You know, to get three people who've gone from a little town in Italy, Calabria, right? And just to put this into people's perspective here, my grandmother only ever saw that town in Calabria. She didn't go to Milan. She never knew what Rome was like. She's never been to Paris. She never went to anywhere. She went from this little, tiny little village onto a ship to Australia. And in Australia, she might have gone to Melbourne once, right? Never, never. In, and, and that's what they were like. So to grab three in, 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 they were in their 70s at the time, um, grab them and take them to Australia and then from there fly them to another part of the world to see their grandson on stage in front of three or 4,000 people a night. Well, they were just so proud. And and one of my grandfathers wrote his uh, autobiography just for us, you know, not that he was, you know, anyone, like it's not sold in bookshops or anything. He just wrote his his story for us. And in the story, he said that was his proudest moment. So, that, you know, that's nice. And and the greatest thing about it is that I've got it all documented. Mm. So they, they got a civic reception uh, in Toronto. They got uh, they received a, an official welcome by the Australian Consulate General. Uh, they, they were with me at shows. They were at store signings. They were on the news. They, I had my grandfather, one of them who spoke English, on the number one radio station in Toronto you know, to have all that documented so that one day I can show my grandchildren and we'll put it in a vault and show all my cousins and their children, I, I, you know, I, nothing really is going to beat that. That is right. so awesome. Listeners, in the opening, I said that Joe's been dubbed the biggest comedian you've never heard of. He's recorded the fastest selling comedy show ever in Canada by selling 6,400 tickets in two hours. So you may not have heard of Joe, but now you have, and now you will, and you'll watch his stuff and be hooked like I have, and then you'll tell somebody else. But Joe, what is it like for you to have that tag of being the biggest comedian you've never heard of, so you're still somewhat like under the radar? Yeah, well, it's great. I'll tell you why it's great. From a business perspective, I haven't even touched the the, the, the tip of the iceberg, to be honest, right? Because... Yes, I sell out theaters two, three thousand people a night, um, or I've done arenas ten thousand people as well. But there's still a lot of people who've never heard of me, and it's fantastic because it means that I've got longevity in this. You know, I'm 47, so I've got another 20 years of doing this. There are people that are still now discovering me. This morning, before I did this podcast. I did a radio interview with, with, a, with the number one radio station in Sydney. I've got emails from people going, I've never heard of you. You're hilarious. <laughs> I've got to come to your show. And it's great. It really is. My, you know, my ego died a long time ago. You know, I, I, I had enough fame when I was, you know, uh, 27, 28, 29, 30 that I, that I got over that. I had enough. Uh, it, it, was, it was enough to satisfy my ego. After that, it became a business. Right, and so it's so knowing that there's people still to come on board. It's actually better, I think, that way because I think that if I'd peaked at thirty, I would have blown money 
I would have, you know, partied too much and I wouldn't have focused and I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so the fact that I've done all that, I got it out of my system and now I'm focused on producing comedy shows and better comedy styles and better material and now more people are coming, I think, I think it worked well for me. So I'm happy to be the biggest comedian no one's ever heard of. How do you keep fresh material for new fans coming in but also for yeah. your loyal fans that keep following you. Yeah, absolutely. You have to. Because there was a period there where I kind of didn't refresh it, especially for this tour. Um, and I've never done this before. It was always kind of one routine in, one routine out. And I did a new one. Let's get rid of that one. You know, because I'm on stage for an hour and a half. So as long as I did my hour and a half, how I did it, you know, I really wasn't concerned as long as people were laughing. But this particular tour here, they have some respect to it, world tour. I said out with all that, with all the all the my, my and and I had some killer fifteen year material, some gags that that were being developing for fifteen years. So if you you can listen to that in its infancy back then, and you hear it now, uh, you'll see how it's developed. And I'm still adding bits and pieces, but I've said no, drawn a line in the sand. Out goes all the material, and I I never wrote. A show before from scratch and it's a lot easier than I thought and well for me it was anyway and it was such a great experience I'm really excited I, I, I've actually I'm more excited now than I ever have been to perform and and I never used to watch comedy I've got to confess and a lot of people might think this is weird I wasn't into comedy I, I got into comedy because I wanted to see what other people do and you know, and how can I make my show different and bigger and better? And so I started to learn about comedy. So believe it or not, I'm only just starting, Tommy. I, I, I'm, I'm, as a comedian, just starting now. So it's really exciting. What's the trick or the tip to keep an audience laughing for 90 minutes? When you were talking yeah. earlier about you were on stage for five, but if you can keep them laughing for one... You're yeah. good, but now that you're the the headliner and the rock star of comedy, how do you keep them going for ninety? Well, it's a okay. So you break it up into stories. Okay, so ninety minutes is a collection of tiny little stories. So I focus on the little stories, making each little story great first. Okay, like this is the process that I've been doing for this tour. This is how you, how you put it, how I put a, a tour together, a show, a new show. So I have all these ideas. I write that little bit. Could be a minute, it could be 30 seconds, it could be three minutes. I then do shows, private shows, corporate shows, um, uh, and, I, and I put on certain little shows and I test it. So I do my old stuff and in between I test all these new bits. Now, and I've been doing that for six, seven months now. So now I've got all those six or seven uh, uh, months of new bits and I've got a list of everything that works and I write down, did it work? No, it didn't work. Redo it. Oh, now it works. And so now I've got all those six or seven bits and I sew them together into a story. So it seems like one long story and that one long story lasts 90 minutes. And, of course, it has to be funny Funnier, get funnier, funnier, and funnier. At a certain point, you have to give people a bit of a break so you do some lesser material because you need to get them breathing again for the end. And then you and, – and it's and – it's, it's, it's you know, and I'm very conscious of laughs. So and – and you can see my style. So if you see now, I'm rapid fire. Now I'm, I smash people. I'm like a machine gun of, of jokes. But when I first started, there was a lot of – there was 15 seconds between me, stop, me stopping, looking around. <laughs> and now when I look at me doing that, I go, what are you doing? Get on with the joke, mate. Hurry up. You can't just leave 15 seconds like that. And I can't go back to being that relaxed on stage. And I'm back. So can you imagine you come from my show for 90 minutes and I'm just hammering people for 90 minutes straight with observations, gags, um, impressions, and it just just goes. I mean, I've, I do more than 90. I mean, some shows I've done 90, uh, about 105 minutes straight, 
And I could have kept going. I could do. I can do. I've done two hours in Chicago. Once I did two hours. Um, it's not a problem for me to do that. I don't know how do you keep it going. You got to be funny, and and you got to you got to make people wanting more. You, you got to know when to get out. You know, or, or when a joke. You get out of that joke. Hey, enough. You've done too much of it. Move on. Yeah. We've talked about how you sell out shows and sell out many different arenas. Did yeah. you have a show? Is this true that? There was two brothers and one didn't get in and there was end up being a fight and the police got called. Is that a true story? How do you know that story? Research. Must have done the- <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of research. <laughs> okay. So what happened was there were two brother-in-laws. They didn't like, well, one of them didn't like the other brother-in-law, but he didn't tell him. So one, this brother-in-law says to this guy, he goes, are you going to come to the Joe Vardy show? I'm going to get tickets. And this brother-in-law says, nah, nah, I don't want to go. Anyway, this brother-in-law doesn't get tickets because no one said they wanted to go. But in the meantime, this one brother-in-law went behind his back and did get tickets. So he came to the show and this brother-in-law found out that this brother-in-law was at the show. So he rang him up and he said, I know you're at the Joe Vardy show. I asked you if you wanted to come. You said no. Meanwhile, you've gone behind my back and got tickets. So let's let's have it out. Because I'm outside in the car park. Come out and let's deal with this. Obviously, you've got a problem with me. And the brother or other brother in law said, No, leave me alone. He goes, Well, if you don't come out, I'm gonna ring the venue and ho- and, and put a, a hoax bomb scare. <laughs> so anyway. We had an intermission. During the intermission, the phone rang, and sure enough, there was a bomb scare. The venue manager came into our room because obviously everyone now has to be evacuated. He came in and they have to ring the bomb squad. So he came into our room and said, someone has just called as a bomb in the in the venue. We have to call the bomb squad. They call the police. The police come down. While the police coming down, everybody is now outside. So the brother-in-law who didn't get the tickets, who's waiting in the car, he sees the brother-in-law come out, he gets out of the car, runs up to him, doesn't have a discussion, and king hits him. Do you know what a king hit is? Just from behind. just Like a sucker just, punch. But yeah, okay, you call that a sucker punch, right? Um, and broke his jaw, broke his nose. So now I'm, we didn't know this. Obviously we don't know the story. So now one of my friends who was outside saw this, comes running back in because we were still inside waiting for the police. He comes running in saying, oh, my God, someone is bashing up your audience members. <laughs> so can you imagine us who doesn't know what's going on between these two brother-in-laws going, Fuck, someone's called a bomb on us. Our audience is being bashed up. It was like... Remember when Remember when the plane hit the building in September 11 and everyone's going, oh, some idiot's driven into the building. And then you see that second one. And as you see the second one going into the building, your mind auto- automatically, everyone thought the same thing. went, oh, my God, this is war. This is the end of the world. So that's what it was like. So that's what happened. So people were fighting to get into the show. We had 20 other shows on that tour. The guy could have come to another one. <laughs> was that so the guy got done for assault. Well, his brother-in-law, more importantly, he, got, he, he was hospitalized with a, with a broken jaw and a broken nose. That's a very powerful hit. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the other one is now, well, I don't, I'm not sure if he did, did jail time, but he would have been charged for assault. The rock star Pretty comedy good. people, you got to get tickets. Otherwise, you, you don't want to be on the other end of that. Joe, yeah. you, you also have a podcast, a serious yes. chat with a comedian. Speak about yes. the show. Okay, so basically over the 25 years that I've been traveling around the world, I meet really, really interesting people, uh, limo drivers who've, got, who've driven Oprah and other interesting people. I've, I've, I've met rock stars. I meet actors. I meet scientists. I meet uh, people in the energy field. I meet um, – uh, um, people who make stuff up, you know, um, uh, inventors. So a restaurateur, chefs. So I thought, you know what, instead of me telling other people about the fascinating stories that these people have, I'm going to get one forum 
and interview them all and put them all on there. So if I have somebody that I want you to know about, I'm just going to, hey, just go and listen to my podcast. So that's what I've done. So we've got, I think, 10 episodes straight away. It's called A Serious Chat with a Comedian. So it's called A Serious Chat because it's me, the comedian, talking seriously to other people. And it shows a different side to me. I mean, we, we do have some fun. We tell some funny stories. But because I'm a scientist, I've got that sort of anal- an, an, an analytical brain. So I like to get, and like you do, like, and I find out a lot more about the people. And I delve into questions that maybe they haven't been asked. Uh, and I'm sure you get this a lot because you're this kind of interviewer. I'm sure you get people saying to you, you know what, I've done thousands of interviews and no one's ever asked me that question. You're that kind of guy, I can tell. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy I am. And that's what I do. So I get, like I've Tim Farris from In Excess, Nick Chester from Jet, Dr. John, John Martini, who was on The on the um, the Secret. And I, I ask them questions that people don't ask them. So that's what my podcast is about. And that's why I like doing this show is to research and ask questions that you guys don't normally get because you do so many interviews. I try to find something that's a little bit different and maybe you haven't talked about a bunch. Yeah. Do you also have a children's book named When I Was Your Age? Right there, right in front of them. There it is. Now, I wrote this children's book because I wanted my children to know what it was like to grow up as me, as an ethnic. Mm. So... And this is the book here, right? It's called When I Was Your Age. And I, it's called When I Was Your Age because that's what my dad would always say to me. When I was your age, because <laughs> I'd say to my dad, Papa, can you drive me to school? I don't want to catch the bus. When I was your age, we don't have a bus. I used to walk 40 kilometers to get it to school every day. 40, right? And every ethnic father's got the same story. And then when you go to Italy and you go to see where the school was, it was right next to the house, Tommy. It was ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, so that's what this book is about. So you see here, you see that's my son, Antonio. Well, my son's one year old, but that's him as seven, eight-year-old. That's supposed to be me. But you see how I've made myself skinny? Right? <laughs> and I've got hair. Pretty cool, eh? Because that's what you can do when you're right your own show. And this that's is right. supposed to be my nonna Maria, my grandmother, or my mum, you know? So through this book, through these stories, Antonio learns from the interaction between his mum and his dad and his dad and himself what it's like. This is my favourite um, page in the book. So they go to the nonna's house, and I don't know if this happens in America, but this happens a lot in Australia. So this is a typical, this is a typical house in Australia with the, the columns, the lions out the front, brick, Brick house. But you see, this, this is a massive um, satellite dish. Satellite dish. So every Italian and every Greek has this huge satellite dish in their yard just to get the Italian channel, one channel. <laughs> right? And I don't know if they do that in America, but they do that a lot in Australia. So that's what the book is about. It's my first book. I, I love doing it. And, and it's one of my routines, sort of, you know, you know, it, it's about um, Antonio, how he has to get up and go to soccer and his dad kicks the door in and says, why do you wake me up like that? Because when I was your age, that's how your grandfather used to wake me up. <laughs> I want to sleep in because when I was your age, we weren't allowed to sleep in because you weren't allowed to sleep in when you're Italian. There's no sleeping in for no. kids. You know, and, and then he eats junk food and he's not allowed to eat junk food. And the father says to him, make sure you don't tell Nonna that we just had junk food, that we had McDonald's. Because when I was your age, I wasn't allowed to eat McDonald's. <laughs> anyway, and then you know, they get to the house and the nonna gives him all this food and they drive. You can see they're in the car driving away with all this food in the back, right? And um, and the nonna says, I miss you already. And, uh, and the father said, I can't believe that nonna just told you that she misses you because the only time she ever told me she missed me is when she went to whack me and I ducked. <laughs> right? So... That's what, you know, there's a lot of jokes. And the, and, the, and it's kind of like The Simpsons. You know how The Simpsons, you can, uh, there's jokes for kids, but there's also jokes mm-hmm. for adults at the same time? That's what that book is about. So you can read it to the kids, they go to bed, then the adults can sit around the table and read it themselves. Go to joeavati.com. You can get your hands on the book. I'll put a link in the show notes as well. The upcoming world tour. Have some respect. How many stops are you going and when's it kicking off? So it kicks off in May here in Australia, and it goes all the major towns in Australia. So in so I kind of do Australia in three sections. I do it 
all of May. Then I go to Canada and America and I do Vancouver, Kamloops, Montreal, Toronto, New Jersey, New York, San Jose, Los Angeles. Back to Australia until August and finish the tour off there. Then next year, I finish off the rest of America, the rest of Canada, all of Europe, Belgium, Scotland, Ireland, England, South Africa, New Zealand, and then I finish off all Australia. And that's me done for two years. And then I'm going to take a break. I'll bet you are. Yeah. Like I said, I do some research. Yeah. My understanding is before yeah. Joe Avati takes the stage, Joe mm-hmm. Avati is sleeping backstage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Not on this tour. On this tour, I'll be going through new material, fresh material that I've just written for this show. So no, no sleeping. No sleep. <laughs> One of my uh, colleagues has got um, a collection of photos of me sleeping under tables, uh, on two chairs, um, underneath a curtain because because so between the curtain and and so the stage is over here, but then there's the curtain and the backstage and there's sometimes a little wall and I'll sleep in between there <laughs> because I get darkness. You know, I'm strange like that. Joe, what's it mean for you and why is it important for you to be an ambassador for Bully Zero, the Australia Foundation? Um, I get a lot of kids that um, that follow me and I think uh, it's important that if I can use my channels just to get, you know, if I can get to 10 kids and say, hey, kids, if you are being bullied, it's not good, right? And I talk about, you know, being bullied myself you know, because obviously – you know, with a name like Giuseppe in Australia, <laughs> it's uh, you're going to get a bit of shit. <laughs> so um, so I, I got bullied for that. I was a fat kid at school, which kind of sucked because do you remember the seesaw? I was yes. like this. I, I was always here. You're always on the bottom. I, I, I could never. I was always at the bottom of the seesaw. Um, so I got teased for being fat. I got teased for having one eyebrow. I got teased for having smelly. Uh, sandwiches at school so I know what it's like so if I can influence a kid and say hey you know if you are being bullied speak up about it and do not bully other kids because it's not nice no I think that's fantastic that you're standing up for that doing something about it something that's important to me is time I value your time and thank you for taking out of your busy schedule to be on before the lights and chatting with my listeners and I hope now that we've opened some more eyes and now more people are going to be in tune and start following Joe Avati. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. I've had a, a really good time. You're a lovely guy. I can tell that. You've got a great energy. You've got a great smile. And um, it's very, you know, I really enjoyed your questions. And thank you for going to the trouble of researching my career and, and what I've done. And thank you for telling everyone that I sleep before a show. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but not on this tour. Not on this tour. Joe is not. Not on this tour. <laughs> not on this tour. Listeners, go follow me on Instagram at Before the Lights Podcast. And there's five more minutes called The Extra Five coming up. You want to get your hands on it? Go to BeforeTheLightsPod.com slash support. That's BeforeTheLightsPod.com slash support and join the members area. Thank you for listening to Before the Lights. I'm Tommy Canale, and until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin-chin. <laughs>